I kind of need a moment before we begin this one. This is my decade. I started reviewing cartoons in 2013, and here we are seven years later, and I'm basically looking back on my entire career. In terms of previous decades, I did have to do research, and I got introduced to a bunch of new shows that I had never seen before, but for most of the cartoons on this list, I have had an intimate knowledge with them. I have made a career bashing them, after all. And for better or worse, it's because of these shows that I have my YouTube account, which is the best thing that ever happened to me. So, no matter what I say to any of these shows, I do have to be at least a little bit thankful with each and every one of them on the list. Each of them is another little memory, and they were a part of the path to where I am today. So, what did we do this decade? I think the better question is, what didn't we do this decade? It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. In terms of pretty much all media, the 2010s is interesting. While the consensus is the 90s was a pretty good decade in terms of at least animation, and the 2000s was not, the 2010s doesn't have much of a consensus at all, because it has both the best best cartoons ever made, and the worst cartoons ever made. Maybe it's just me because, like, my favorite cartoon ever and my least favorite cartoon ever both aired this decade only a few years apart, but still, the bridge between the good stuff and the bad stuff is wider than it has ever been in history. Cartoons did all kinds of new and exciting things they didn't get a chance to do since the 90s. Streaming and the internet let shows get away from things like regulations and the old standards and practices that held a lot of creativity back. We got in shows like Bojack Horseman, Rick and Morty, and Adventure Time, things we wouldn't have gotten in any other decade. Of course, this means we got other shows that the censors probably would have and should have gotten to. Like, The Problem Solvers, or Big Mouth, or Neo Yokio. It was one of the most experimental decades in animation history, except for all the times when it was the least creative, most watered-down time in animation history. So many shitty reboots. Not just in animation either, but in animation it was especially bad. I mean, not all of them were terrible, but as the decade dragged on, we got more and more pieces of the past, to the point where it felt like you were living in the 80s and you were just trying to find the DeLorean to get home. Magic School Bus, Powerpuff Girls, Teen Titans. Even the Nut Shack, of all things, tried to cash in on nostalgia by releasing a second season. I keep getting nightmares that we're gonna see a Mega Babies reboot someday. Then there was the other big thing that I don't like talking about. The 2010s, especially the later 2010s, got very polarized politically. As time went on, our lives got more and more political, as more and more people dealt with issues that they found increasingly close to home. Whether it be things like social justice, climate change, school shootings, or a certain election. It seemed like everyone had an opinion magnified by social media, especially the people that we really didn't care about their opinions. And that kind of stuff trickled down into media, to the point where avoiding politics became an increasingly difficult thing to do, especially because people started beating down on you if you refused to take a stance. It became kind of worrying, but you're not here for the depressing talk of reality, are you? I mean, that's why we watch television and movies and read books. It's because we want to forget about the world around us, not have it shoved in our face, am I right? Seriously, everyone wanted to tell you their opinions. Actors and artists especially, whether they had a clue or not. Yes, little Dicky, we must save the Earth to protect the STDs, I'm right with ya! That's probably a good sum up of the quality of social commentary in the 2010s. Alright! Rules for this list. I'm changing them a little bit this time around. Because I reviewed so many cartoons that aired in the 2010s, it'd be pointless and stupid for me to keep the stipulation that I couldn't have reviewed the show. I'm also still not counting internet cartoons. Maybe next decade, but not this one. They still don't have the power to really compete with the mainstream stuff yet. Also, for this list's purpose, streaming cartoons, like the stuff you'd find on Netflix or Amazon Prime, they don't count as internet cartoons. And this time around, a show only needs to have a 12 episodes to be included on this list, instead of the usual 13. I decided to give a few other cartoons a little little bit of an opportunity to show up here, because they really deserved it. Alright, let's walk down memory lane and see the shits that we took in the 2010s. So I plead with you, my plaza folks, please turn in all of your remotes. We can make the plaza safe for all, so what do you say? Let's end this brawl! So, uh, remember the first one of these countdown lists, the top 10 worst cartoons of the 2000s? On that list, I put on what I thought was a controversial choice, Drawn Together. I thought that it was a terrible show, but I understood that a lot of people liked it, and I opened it up with a bunch of I'm sorry's. Well, this time around, I'm not really going to be apologizing for any of my opinions, which, in hindsight, I think is a mistake for a reviewer or really anyone to do if we're talking about media. Don't apologize for your opinions on media. I bring this up because at least half of my choices on this list, I think, are going to be on a similar level. Many of the things that ended up making my worst list are controversial for a variety of reasons. So, I want to say that I understand if you like these shows, 
shows, so long as you understand that I don't. So that being said, let's talk about Lauren Faust's DC Superhero Girls. I like Lauren Faust and most of her work. Friendship is Magic was obviously a big show in my life, and it's probably gonna make the best list of the 2010s whenever I get around to it. But not every single episode of that show was fantastic, and I never pretended that it was. One of the worst episodes of that show that comes to mind is Dragon Quest. It was an episode that meant to showcase that it was okay for boys to do girly things, using a metaphor. Boys were the dragons, and girls were the ponies. Then, of course, it had a line like this. I don't act like other dragons. Oh, not even close. But why would you want to, Spy? Now, imagine, if you will, that we stripped away the metaphor. You're not like other boys, but why would you want to be? You're not like other girls. But why would you want to be? You're not like other black people, but why would you want to be? This could be argued as me looking too deep into the episode, but the episode itself goes on and it seems to really believe in its implications. Not only are you not like that other group, but there's no reason that you should want to be. They're brutish and mean, and there's nothing redeemable about them. Now imagine, if you will, there was an entire show where every single episode was Dragon Quest. That's DC Superhero Girls. My favorite episode is Hashtag Hate Triangle. A supervillain starts attacking a male superhero. His friend, a female superhero, constantly wants to know what he did to justify her anger. You know, because victim blaming is one of the most feminist messages out there. And then when he explains that he broke up with her via text, she goes mental and starts attacking him. Like, on a surface level, that that's not funny. But the messaging of the show is just broken beyond all belief. Personally, I don't hate feminism, but shows like this don't help with that. This is the kind of stuff that feminism gets stereotyped as making guys look like idiots to push up their female characters. And of course, empowerment means being an asshole and being completely stoic. So many of the episodes of the show are like this. And if this entry gets you upset with my list, you're not gonna like much of the rest of it, because this is a good sum-up of one of the worst problems with the media in the 2010s. Like I said, every single writer or artist felt obligated to have an opinion on whatever issue. Social justice, feminism, gun control. And the problem is that most of them had no clue what they were doing. Even great shows like BoJack Horseman, with some of the strongest writing that I've ever seen, occasionally bungled it up when they dealt with political issues. And, uh... This show does not have strong writing. If it was just the politics that was wrong with the show, there, there are a million shows that I could pick. No, what gets me with this show is the writing. It's bad. Like, this show seems to be written for preschoolers. Within the first 30 seconds of each episode, you will know what the moral is. Bumblebee doesn't even try to jump to the fairy because she doesn't believe in herself. Well, you know what the message is? Believe in yourself. It seriously feels like it was aimed at a younger audience than Friendship is Magic, which kind of backfires on the feminist aspect of the show. That's another thing that I've noticed about activists. Activists who fight for women or people of color or other marginalized groups tend to not have a high opinion of the group that they're fighting for. I mean, why else would you make this writing so juvenile? It's so your target audience can actually understand it, right? It's like that Simpsons episode where they divided the school between boys and girls and asked the girls how numbers felt instead of doing actual math. This is the story equivalent of figuring out how numbers feel. In one episode, Diana, Wonder Woman, fails at doing everything because she's in love with a boy. This episode outright and literally states that Wonder Woman is literally a symbol of female empowerment. And this is the episode they have her completely inept over a boy with. Th this is some kind of chalk zone, only bad ideas get erased shit. And then four of our superheroes think that the best solution to this is to try and outright kill Diana's crush. Because that's what a good role model will do. It's episodes like this that make the show worse than Teen Titans Go. When Go made an episode like Boys vs. Girls, it was mocking shows like this. Shows that tried to proclaim equality, but in the end said that one side was better than the other. While making everyone completely unlikable. Also, we see Diana fail each and every single thing before they all decide to do something about this, um, problem. That's how each episode of the show goes. Because there are six characters, we need to have one character do the exact same thing with the other five. Diana needs to fail at five different goddamn things. Bumblebee needs to try and rally all five of her friends. Every single episode is like this. The show is clearly inspired by one of Lauren Foss's previous projects, Super Best Friends Forever, which was a series of shorts. It sounds like a match made in heaven. Lauren gets to write on a very feminist superhero show. But the problem is, the show is still written like it's a series of shorts. Every single episode has a plot that's only worth three minutes, that they stretch out as much as possible and then they throw forth the moral without any hint or subtlety. In a short, it's understandable, but in an actual cartoon, it gets old fast. But seriously, if there's any reason to hate this show, it's because each episode title starts with a hashtag. And if there's anything that can get you to appear as a piece of the worst parts of the 2010s culture, it's probably that. Seriously, hashtags? One of the tackiest possible things? Who does that? Yeah, perfect idea, taking influence from a show about an abusive little shit and her stupid friend, who is made by someone that most of the world considers a creeper. So I plead with you, my plaza folks, please turn in all of your 
remote. We could make the plaza safe for all. So what do you say? Let's end this brawl. The singular identity of the 2010s is definitely how experimental it was. Animation in the 2010s came up with a lot of unique and interesting ideas that you wouldn't be able to find in any other decade. Even something considered creator-driven like the 90s. This is the decade where cartoons got weird, and sometimes they got weird by being incredibly down to earth. We have Bojack Horseman, a show about a famous celebrity who used to be on television, and it went deep into the reality of how fame can screw a person up. Adventure Time, a silly show full of random humor, has metaphors for Alzheimer's, and seems to take place after a major war. Of course, this is a double-edged sword. It's why the 2010s, in my opinion, was the best decade for animation history, and the worst. We've had a lot of cartoons that had nothing more than frustrated people shitting their opinions on screen for 22 minutes straight, and we've also had some of the most tactless and visually gross shows ever made. Stuff that could make the 90s blush. Shows like Alan Gregory that thought a gay man basically brainwashing a straight man into being his lover was funny. There were shows like King Star King, which was nothing but blood and gore and grossness. And it wasn't even all aimed at adults either. Grosso came back in a big way in shows like Adventures of Kid Danger and Fleabag Monkey Face. There are obviously a lot of these cartoons, more than I can even mention, and not a lot of spots on this list. So I think that I'm just gonna pick the worst of them and basically make it a placeholder for the trend as a whole. <laughs> Bet you forgot about this one. I don't see how you could have. It came out in 2014 and it lasted until 2019. That's over half a decade of this demon dog. People really like this show. And for the love of God, I cannot figure out why. Mr. Pickles is a parody of a kid series, The Story of Lassie. Adults perverting kid stories is not a new thing in animation. In fact, there's going to be one further down this list. But seriously, animation has been doing this since the 70s, at least with the film Once Upon a Girl, in which Mother Goose told about the true stories of the fairy tales, which all happen to be pornographic. Even more recently, we've had Where the Dead Go to Die, which is also about a cute dog committing unspeakable acts of horror. I've long since given up talking about shows like Mr. Pickles, because there isn't much you can say about them. They're gross, and they have no tact. Beyond that, there is no substance. They exist to do nothing but to shock the audience at every single turn. There's no real effort here, and that's what gets the show on the list more than the other ones I've mentioned. It's just so pointless. Alan Gregory and Adventures of Kid Danger or other shows like that were at least trying to do something different. They were trying to go beyond making something shocking, make the audience gag. They thought what they were doing was funny. They were Darwin Award quality stupid thinking that what they were doing was funny, but at least I could tell that they were trying to do something rather than gross out the audience. Back when the second gross out trend started in the early 2010s, literally the only thing that could cross my mind was, we've already been past this. We've gone through the gross out phase and we've grown up. But then again, I suppose people being inspired by shows they've seen as a kid, leading to what they create today, isn't exclusive to good cartoons. Seriously, parents, don't let your kids watch things like Mega Babies, or one day they'll make something like Mr. Pickles. That kind of stuff scars you for life. That's why we should care about what our kids watch. Another thing that sets Mr. Pickles apart from its ilk is the actual quality of the animation is terrible. There's something about King Star King. Even with all of its gore and gross out, it looks like a lot of talent actually went into drawing and animating it. It understood the idea of appeal. Appeal is a very important principle of animation, which most adult cartoons seem to forget, even some of the good ones. It doesn't mean that all the characters need to look good, but they need to be something that you want to look at. They can either be cute or mysterious or even eerie. Every single character in Mr. Pickles looks disgusting. Every single frame of the show demands that you look away. To this day, Mr. Pickles is one of the most unpleasant viewing experiences that I've ever had in reviewing bad cartoons. When you look worse than something like Ren and Stimpy adult party cartoon, that's bad. When your animation quality is worse than Family Guy, that's bad. When you end up propagating stereotypes that all adult cartoons not only look like this but should, by giving this shit four fucking seasons and then leaving it on the air for five years, that's bad. The 2010s was not a good decade for pickles. Whether it be Pickle and Peanuts, this show, or the Pickle Rick fiasco. Let's just say that it's a good thing that the Tommy Pickles reboot didn't come out in the 2010s. So I plead with you, my plaza folks, please turn in all of your remotes. We can make the plaza safe for all. So what do you say? Let's end this ball. Wow, a lot happens in a decade, doesn't it? I seriously thought this cartoon was a 2000s thing, because by the time it actually came out in 2012, this trend was just so goddamn dead. Do you know what's worse than mindlessly trying to shock your audience? How about mindlessly trying to shock your audience and being bad at it? Brickleberry's first joke is showing a bunch of animals having sex, but the Family Guy style of animation makes all of them look like fucking blow-up dolls. This came out in the 2010s, when adult cartoons were at their lowest point in animation history. Comedy Central and Fox were racing to come up with the next Family Guy or South Park, 
Park, despite the fact that both South Park and Family Guy were still running, and they were still really popular. And in doing so, they came up with a string of some of the worst cartoons of all time. I really badly wanted to put Legend of Chamberlain Heights on this list because of how blatantly it tried to rip off South Park, with its crude art style and terrible humor. But hey, you watch one ripoff, you watch them all, right? And Brickleberry is just the worst of them all. And to boot, it even has the worst inspiration. Back in the day, like, right when the Cleveland show came out, College Humor had a bit on Seth MacFarlane shows, basically claiming how they were all the same. You got a stupid man, beautiful woman, well, beautiful is the wrong word considering the quality of the animation within these shows, and of course, you need to have your talking animals. Seth MacFarlane has nothing to do with the show, but that's the only surprising thing about Brickleberry. Every joke that you come across in this show is so patently predictable. They try and go for the most shocking things ever. Maybe back in the day, like when I first started reviewing, I would be shocked and offended and all screaming, but now I, I'm just so numb to this, and I'm pretty sure the vast majority of the television viewing audience is. What are you supposed to get from these kind of shows when you've seen the stupid main characters with a reckless disregard for life time and time again? When you've seen quote unquote cute talking animals doing cruel and horrendous things? When you've seen these shows giving drive-by opinions that no one wants to hear passing as social commentary? I mean, the show was made by Daniel Tosh, and his style of comedy does really get old really quickly. It just doesn't work on its own like this. Black humor deliberately trying to be offensive. That can only work if you get a reaction of someone. And if everyone else is just looking on in bored silence, then you've got nothing at all but bored silence. I will say there is one thing that's kind of impressive about the show, and that Brickleberry might actually hold the secret to time travel. See, I've discovered something very amazing that happens when you watch an episode of Brickleberry. You see, 10 minutes of watching the show feels like an hour passing by in the real world. If you had Brickleberry on in the background, you could probably clean your entire house, do taxes, get lobotomized, and even more, within an hour. The only problem is that I'd rather do any of those things than watch the show for another second. Brickleberry is the animation equivalent of a dog finding vomit on the road, eating it, and then vomiting it back up. What, what do I even say about a show like Brickleberry? The characters are unlikable, the animation is shit, well, no shit. That's what Family Guy and South Park do is gotta be a requirement, right? Luckily for all of us, it seems like the Family Guy era is finally winding down, because I have to watch another second of Border Town. I'm gonna go on a rampage. Wait, th did I just say Border Town? Th that's right, I wasn't talking about Border Town. Then again, maybe I was. Honestly, I can't tell the difference. Can you? So I plead with you, my plaza folks. Please turn in all of your remotes. We can make the plaza safe for all. So what do you say? Let's On some level, I can forgive assaulting my eyes like Mr. Pickles did, but when you assault my ears like this show did, you're on my permanent shit list. I stand by what I said in my review. If you think Bunsen's voice is even remotely okay, even like just a little bit tolerable, you need to schedule an immediate ear appointment because this is one of the worst voices that I have ever heard. Like, ever. <laughs> And you get right into the problem with this one, even in the theme song, which was composed by... Wait, this was composed by Guy Moon. That... That has to be a mistake on Wikipedia. Guy Moon has been working with Butch Hartman since the beginning. He composed the theme songs to Danny Phantom and Fairly Odd Parents, and all of the other music on the shows. And those shows had some damn good music. Even Tough Puppy had a really good theme song. What the hell happened here? Oh yeah, that's right, it's the singers. Half of the song is sung by Bunsen, and the other half is Amanda. I said Bunsen's the worst, but honestly, I do go back and forth between Bunsen and Amanda. Maybe that's why the theme sounds like it does, because the voices that they chose for this show made Guy Moon go deaf. I don't even know what to say about Bunsen as a beast. There's so little to it. I understand that Butch Hartman has kind of become a big target of the decade, because he didn't start the decade out so great, and it's kind of been worse and worse ever since. I mean, Danny Phantom is a show that people love, but after Steve Marmel left, in the third season, it dropped hard. And then Butch made Tough Puppy, which some people liked, but it didn't manage to break the mass consciousness like the previous two shows did. Meanwhile, Fairly Odd Parents, his biggest hit, was being pounded into the ground. Whether it was the network's choice or his choice to have those terrible live action movies and had a million characters, I have no idea. But each of his shows was worse than the last. And when Tough Puppy didn't take off like his previous two shows, he decided to make Bunsen as a beast to just punish everyone who didn't like it. And I stand by it. He's the M. Night Shyamalan of animation. He was once a guy who had a lot of reputation, and people expected good things about him. But then he all blew it sky high. I know that in the past I said that I wouldn't go on about the people behind the shows as much as I used to, because generally speaking, they haven't done much wrong besides making a bad show or bad episode. But Butch has done plenty of things that deserve ire and my disrespect. So I look at people that critique as weak. Weak rhymes with critique. 
So, you know, if you're going to critique like, a, hey, this is this is never going to work or whatever, then I just say, you know what, let's see you try it and then we'll see how you do. So go ahead and critique away because all it does is make me stronger. Most infamously is the whole Oaxis debacle. We're still waiting on that streaming service or anything besides a template webpage and asking for more money. Oh yeah, and he does things like tease the Danny Phantom revival on his YouTube channel, despite the fact that he doesn't have the copyright to it and I'm fairly sure that Nickelodeon doesn't want anything to do with him anymore. If Bunsen is a beast, reputation is anything to go on. Oh yeah, and then there's the whole critique rhymes with weak phrase he came up with and his talking down of negativity. To any future creatives, I beg of you, do not listen to Butch Hartman. Whether you like any of his shows or not, this one included, if you don't accept critique, you end up like him, pushing away more and more people who made you what you are, and creating worse and worse products. The same thing happened with George Lucas. He had a great idea, and with the help of others, he made something fantastic. But as he got more and more control and surrounded himself with more and more yes-men, he created worse products. And it's the same story here. Bunsen as a beast is not only bad, but it's my least favorite kind of bad. The kind of bad that has no substance. The annoying voices are the worst aspect of the show, but even if you look beyond it, there is nothing worth salvaging here. The characters aren't remotely interesting. It feels very much like a watered-down Foster's home for imaginary friends. And of course, there's the humor, which is basically on the level of modern Fairly Odd Parents. Characters acting too stupid to live, and plenty of the old, and then the opposite happens humor. It's the most distilled of Butch's work, because it feels entirely made up of his cliches, 100%. Because looking at some of the choices in this show, I can clearly tell that no one at any point told him no to any decision he had on this show. So I plead with you, my plaza folks, please turn in all of your remotes. We could make the plaza safe for all. So what do you say? Let's end this ball. Fake news. Fake news. Fake weather. I am probably not going to win any friends with this choice, but it's my list and I absolutely hate this show. I mean, I hate it. Presenting our cartoon president. One of the more defining aspects of the media in the 2010s is how political it got. It seemed like everyone in entertainment had their own opinion on something or other that they wouldn't shut the fuck up about. In 2015, this got to its apex as the United States revved up for its 2016 election, which proved to be one of the most divisive in United States history. There is a lot that I could say about this show. I could say that it's an incredibly bad idea, borderline dangerous, to make a show this politically charged when our times are this divided and polarized, to the point that people rioted after the 2016 election. But instead, I think I'll go on about how much this show sucks as a show beyond its political bullshit. This show has tapped into some of the freshest jokes imaginable. I mean, it's it's gonna be like redefining the game of comedy. So here's one of the main jokes. Have you heard that Trump is orange? Wait, what? You, you actually have heard that joke. Many times, in fact. O okay, H have you heard that Trump has small hands? Oh, oh, you've heard that joke over a million times. Uh, okay, have, have you heard that he's fat, stupid, and racist? Oh, that's not good. You've heard those jokes over a billion times? Th that, that can't be true, can it? I mean, if these jokes were beaten to the ground by the time of the 2016 election, then Stephen Colbert is going to be in huge trouble, because this show came out in 2018. Much of what I don't like about this show has to do with the problem with Trump jokes in general. And yes, Trump jokes have a problem other than just being overdone. It's not just that Trump jokes are bad, it's that they are this black hole of comedy. I was worried the day would come when everyone would find out that I was the worst businessman in history. But now that it's here, it's not so bad! I want to state that I'm not a Trump supporter. I believe that he's done a lot wrong over his life and presidency. In fact, he did something terrible when he decided to run for office back in 2015. The second that he ran for office, he killed the concept of comedy entirely. It's been dead since then, and I don't think it's ever going to recover. You want to hear the first Trump joke I actually laughed at? I couldn't tell you because it never happened. In fact, Trump jokes are so bad on concept that I'm fairly sure that Trump jokes and the people who tell them, like Stephen Colbert, are actually a big reason he got elected. They are so unfunny, I am sure that people go out and vote for Trump just to spite these people. And let's explain to you why Trump jokes do not work. What's the most famous Trump joke of them all? He's orange, right? I mean, he's drawn orange in the cartoon. This joke would read a lot better if it didn't come from the people who claim to be anti-racist. It kind of shoots you in the foot when you're mocking someone for their skin tone, doesn't it? Cotton candy hair, small hands. Okay, alright then. Please go on telling me how body shaming is wrong. 
Oh, that's right, another one. His family changed their name from Drumpf, and because that's a funny foreign sounding name, we should all laugh at it. Except I thought that we were supposed to respect people's cultural backgrounds. I get what the baseline joke is. I understand that there's supposed to be some sense of irony in these jokes. I understand the basic premise of these jokes. The racist guy is Orange, and his family had a foreign sounding name. But that doesn't make the jokes funny. All it does is make it seem like the joke tellers have a major lack of self-awareness. It's hypocritical, at best, and those are the worst type of jokes. Especially when there's such a lack of self-awareness of how hypocritical these people are. And none of this would be so frustrating if these jokes weren't beaten to the ground. Or, you know, the people most famous for making Trump jokes didn't have much ground to stand on. Like Jimmy Kimmel, who has no right to call anyone racist after wearing blackface. Like, I've tried to watch some of these talk shows. Like, I used to be an avid watcher of The Last Week Tonight. But when it became a game of how long in this episode until John Oliver mentions Trump that ended earlier and earlier, even though the episodes had nothing to do with him, I was done, ignoring all of the other problems about Last Week Tonight. Which, maybe I'll get to some other time. I know that I'm going on and on about this one point, Trump jokes, but that's the basis of the show. It is a Trump joke. You ever see that really cringy Donald Trump joke in The Simpsons that everyone hates? You know, the ones where the quote-unquote squad is singing towards Trump? Yeah, that's an entire cartoon. And speaking of a cartoon, the animation of this is just god-awful. This is some of the lowest quality that I have ever seen. And considering we're talking about the world of adult animation where Family Guy is the standard, that's saying something. I heard that the show needed to be storyboarded and animated quickly because it needs to keep up with current events. But then you notice how South Park is able to actually keep up with current events so well that they were able to completely change one of their episodes in a 24-hour time span, when the 2016 election went in a different direction than they had planned. Unless you're doing the South Park thing, having stylization that allows you to do things really quickly, animation is a terrible medium for riffing on current events. I mean, take Family Guy, one of the shows known for riffing on modern-day events. They did a whole series of episodes based on the Justine Sacco tweets, which everyone else really seemed to like, because it came out more than four years after the event. Yes, I, I get the joke. Our current president and our current political climate is a cartoon show. All wacky and ridiculous. Even though cartoons in the 2010s have gotten fairly serious. Donald Trump acts like a cartoon. But the practicality of it, or lack thereof, just shoots the show in the foot. And at this point, the show has so many bullet holes in its foot that the foot needs to be amputated. You know what's worse though? The voices in this show. Have you ever heard a child come up with a mocking voice for someone that they don't like? Well, that's everyone in this fucking show. Every single person talks like that. The worst of them all is Nancy Pelosi, who literally sounds like she's lobotomized. I have to go. I just heard the sun and moon are switching places. If that's true, the birds would be going nuts. Up, oh, we just lost the lease on Capitol Hill. Just impeach him, you stubborn bastard! We can't impeach him because I love him! I I'm not even joking. I, I think that's what Stephen Colbert thinks is a joke. And that brings me to one of the bigger problems with the show. It's incredibly exclusionary. And I don't mean if you like Trump, this show isn't for you. In fact, the show actually makes Trump seem like an underdog hero in some episodes with these little arcs. And it makes everyone in Washington seem corrupt or like an idiot. No, that that's not what I mean. I mean, if you don't know who each and every one of these people people are, and you're not following current events very closely, you are going to be totally lost on each and every episode. You know, I'm gonna give some credit to Family Guy here. When they bring on someone to bash them, they at least give the characters an introduction. They establish who they are. I'm fairly into politics, and even I had a hard time keeping track of everyone involved in these episodes, because some of these episodes are from 2018, and let's just say that a lot of things have changed since then, and the major incidences that happened in 2018 are farther and farther from public memory. At the same time, I could watch a South Park episode from the 2000s and still know just about everything going on. I might miss out on the real-world implications, but it still exists as a show in and of itself. You can enjoy old episodes of South Park as a show. You cannot do that with this one. The jokes in the show are either so rote that they haven't been funny since before Trump took office, or they make no sense. Like, they're randomly coming up with quirks that don't make any sense for any of these people. The real-world Nancy Pelosi, she has a lot of problems in the real world, but they're nothing remotely like how this show portrays her. Same with Ted Cruz. Satirical jokes only work if you take a quality that someone actually has and then exaggerate them to the nth degree. You can't just make shit up whole cloth and give them an entirely new personality that has nothing to do with who they are. In this time when our nation is more divided than it has been in over half a century, I do think it is a good thing that there's something both left-wing and right-wing can agree on. And that's that this show is completely garbage. If you're hardcore right-wing, well, this show mocks Trump. And if you're hardcore left-wing, this show makes him seem like an underdog who relates to the American people, albeit by being an idiot. And if you're a person with good taste, you're like everyone else 
house and realized that this show is terrible. I mean, there's only one time that this show actually made me laugh, and that's when I heard that it's getting renewed for a third season, in 2020. So, that leaves us with either two options, considering that this show would not make much sense if someone else besides Trump got elected in 2020. Either someone at Showtime is incredibly stupid, or they really want Trump to win in 2020. And you know what? I think it's actually probably the latter option, because you know, the second that Trump is out of office, a lot of hackney comedians are going to be losing their job.